Amen. You believe that today? A powerful name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you have your bulletins, I invite you to take the insert that's in the center there and let's uh, look at the word together today. The scriptures are listed for you and some questions that if you'd like, you can use later in the week for your reflection um, as we think about what the word is saying to us today. Well, last week we were blessed to have Rick Gage, uh, who is the main evangelist for the upcoming Go Tell Crusade, come into our community uh, and we hope that Man, nobody here today is wondering, what is the Go Tell Crusade? We want you to know about it. We want to take advantage of this great opportunity. And as Rick Gage uh, challenged us to engage in personal evangelism and to take those people that we wrote their names down last week on that bookmark to pray, to actively look for opportunities to talk with them, and most of all, to invite them to this crusade where they could hear uh, the gospel. And so today we return to our sermon series through the major themes of the Old Testament. And two weeks ago, uh, we talked about the Exodus. And the Exodus means a lot of people leaving. And, uh, and so they, they were, were leaving Egypt where they'd been in slavery for uh, 400 years. And we talked about how God used Moses, how the plagues came and the symbolic meaning of the plagues as well as the literal impact that they had. And then also the Passover. And it's what it meant to the Jewish people then, but what we see that it means today and how it was fulfilled in Jesus, the Passover lamb. And last of all, we talked about the importance of the blood of the lamb being over our heart and that importance uh, to us as believers today. Well, this morning I want to pick up there as the Israelites now have left Egypt and they are on their way to the promised land. But now they're going to have some more drama. You didn't think there wouldn't be drama, did you? There's going to be some more drama on the way back to the promised land. If the Israelites had simply made a straight line journey from uh, Egypt back to the promised land, it would have been a matter of days or maybe even weeks. But God didn't lead them in a straight line journey. Um, Instead, the trip back to Canaan took 40 years. And we're going to look today at why that was. Why did a, 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 a trip of days end up taking years? Today we're going to look at that. And like we've been seeing through this Old Testament series, we're talking about real stories. These are not just allegories or fables. These are real historical events. But the Word of God is so perfect that it's recorded because it also has applications in a big picture that applies to our lives Uh, still today so we're going to look at some of those lessons that we can still learn from the time in the wilderness you know how many of you today know that sometimes the shortest route is not always the best route Uh, I'm learning that through that little app on the phone if I'm going somewhere I've never been I'll just put it in there and my wife sometimes will say I don't think we should go this way and I'm like well Siri says it's the best the shortest route and more than one time, she got to say, I told you so. We end up out in a cornfield somewhere or whatever it might be. Sometimes you just need to listen to your intuition. But sometimes the shortest route is not always the best route. In Exodus 13, we read this. When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God didn't lead them along the main road that runs through the Philistine territory. Even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God said... If the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Now, I don't know if you've ever gotten frustrated with God before. Uh, When you're praying, and it makes perfect sense that this is what God needs to do, and so you tell God what he needs to do in prayer, but God doesn't do what you told him to do, or what you humbly asked him to do, hopefully. Sometimes... He might end up doing it, but he doesn't do it on the timetable that we thought he should. God, what are you waiting around for? This needs to happen now. I need patience and hurry up and give me some patience, God. But sometimes God doesn't work on our timetable, does he? We want God to to answer that prayer to make our wayward spouse come back to us. We can't understand why, why God won't bless our business or our career and why it doesn't just take off right now. What are you waiting on, God? I know you can do it. Maybe we want God to answer that prayer for our wayward child to to wise up and to come back home and return to God's will now. God, what what are you delaying for? 
We want God to take that trial out of our lives now. And we can't understand why he's letting it linger. Why do I have to go through this, God, for so long? Aren't you listening to my prayers? But God, in his infinite wisdom, he sees the big picture. God sees all the potential hazards that are on every possible path we could take through life. And he sits back in his wisdom and he says, well, this would be the shortest. This would be the most painless path. But I know that if they take this path, then these lives will be affected and this will happen. God sees all the possible scenarios. And so sometimes he takes us on the longer path. It might be for our good. Or it might be for the good of somebody else or some other contingency along the way. But God knows what he's doing. Amen? Do we believe that this morning? Amen? God knows what he's doing. In our situations today, it may be that God knows the easiest route would come with a cost. Uh, I think of different stories in the Bible where people chose the easier path, the path of least resistance, and it ended up costing them. Matthew 7 says this, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. Sometimes wisdom says, I'm not taking the shortest route. I'm not taking the easiest route because I sense God is leading me on a different route. And I trust him. And I'm going to go that route. God also knows that sometimes the journey is just as valuable as the destination. And so he sends us on a different route than we were anticipating because there's something to be gained for the journey on that longer route. I believe God sometimes wants us to struggle with a situation for a time before he removes it before he takes us to where he knows is best for us, but he wants us to struggle along the way. Now, that sounds uncaring. That sounds uh, mean or or mean-hearted. But, you know, when I coached football, a, a big part of preparing our team to be successful involved pushing them to their limits in practice before the game. And as coaches, we knew that if we waited until the game for them to get uncomfortable or to be challenged or to get so tired they didn't think that they could could go forward or to face adversity for the first time in a game, they likely would crumble. And so the key, we felt, was to make sure that they experienced that long before the game and they were were, had successful experiences fighting through fatigue. Or facing adversity head on and coming out successfully on the other side of it. And that way when you face that adversity, when you get to the game, it's not your first time. You're experienced with this and you know what to do when adversity hits. We wanted them to know they were capable of more than they realized. And to do that, we had to push them out of their comfort zone. Friends, don't you think God sometimes does that with us? If the Christian life only involves sitting here on a Sunday morning and filling a seat and putting in an hour, well, that'd be easy. But we would be thumb-sucking babies who weren't equipped to handle life. And so sometimes God takes us on a longer journey and lets us go through some stuff in life. And he says, yeah, you're going to go through it, but I'm going to go through it with you. And we're going to get stronger because of this. You're stronger than you realize. You can do more than you realize because I'm with you. We realized that for our our players to understand that, we had to push them outside their comfort zone, and God knows the same thing. And so sometimes it's God that brings the adversity and the challenges in our path. And when we face these trials, we learn to lean into our faith. You know, it's one thing to have Sunday morning theology that we nod our head to when the preacher says it or when we read it from the Bible. But it's another thing to find yourself in the middle of a storm and to make that decision that we all have to make at some point. Do I really believe this or is that just Sunday morning talk? Do I really believe in God's promises or is that just good theology? 
do I really believe in the power of prayer and that God is going to take care of me and see me through as he said he would, or is that just a Sunday school lesson? You see, we all have to wrestle with this. Our faith moves out of the realm of theory when we go through trials and we lean into a daily reality that is tangible and real and impactful in our lives. Sometimes the journey is as important as the destination. I think that's what James meant when he said in James 1, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, when you're pushed out of your comfort zone, and you're having to rely on that faith, your endurance has a chance to grow. Do you look at your trials like that? This is a chance to grow. I need to embrace this. <laughs> Sounds good on Sunday. It's rough on Monday when you're living it, right? So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete and needing nothing. You'll be ready for game day. You'll be ready for the trials that come your way. You know, as they approached the Canaan land, Moses sent out 12 spies to go and check out the land and kind of check out the situation, see what they were up against and report back. Over the past 400 years that they had been in Egypt, some other people had lived in the, moved in and lived in this bountiful land. And so they knew they were, there was going to be a fight involved to take this land back. And so they just wanted to get the scouting report in advance. Moses wanted the spies to check things out and to tell them what's the land like. Uh, is it heavily populated or are there just a few? Do they look like they are put up a good fight or are they kind of scrawny? Uh, is it well fortified or is it just wide open, easy pickings? What kind of resources are available there? Just let us know what we're getting into. And so he sends them out, and the men return from their scouting report, and they, they reported back to Moses what they had seen. And it's as if they said, well, there's good news, and there's bad news. In, in Numbers 13, verse 27, they give them the good news. We entered the land you sent us to explore, Moses, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Then I just imagine there was a pause. Moses said, go on. And they said, but, verse 28, but the people living there are powerful. And their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Now, among the spies, it's interesting to me that the 12 spies all saw the same scouting trip here. They all looked at the same situation but they came back with different perceptions of the same challenge. One of the spies named Caleb advised that they go ahead and take the land. He, he says in, in verse 30, but Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the majority of the other spies advised against that and said, this is not a good idea. What are you thinking, Caleb? Ten of the spies started spreading their negativity among the people. Verses 32 and 33. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. You should have seen. Their arms were like our thighs. I mean, they were huge. Anybody in their right mind knows this is not a good deal for us. It says, we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. Let me just say this, that sometimes people can give you a good word of warning or caution. Spiritually mature people, you should listen when you get a rebuke or just a cool your jets or slow, whoa, 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 slow down. I'm not saying ignore that. But there are some people that the glass is always half empty. You know what I'm talking about? Don't say their name right now, okay? But there are some people that you're never going to get anything positive out of them. They might be in your family. They might be in your workplace. They might be in your social circles. And you share some of the dreams of your heart. And you say, man, this is what I'm excited about right now. This is what I'm thinking and planning about. And, and you know what's coming. You don't even know why you told them. Because they're going to go, that's not going to work. And they just throw cold water on your excitement. And they just squash your dreams. And they, they just keep you in a box. You know why I think it is? Because they're afraid to try themselves. And they don't want anybody else trying anything either. 
They don't want anybody else to have something they're not going to have, and they're just going to play it safe all the time. Listen, toxic people can, can change the climate of a family, a business, a team, or a church. And we've got to be careful. If you give those people a prominent platform for spreading their negativity, they'll throw cold water on the vision of the church. Uh, they'll, they'll quench the potential accomplishments and achievements and the fruit that could be born in a situation. And it's wise for us to just recognize that some people, the glass is always going to be half empty. Now, there are times when we need to hear a word of caution. But we need to have the discernment to recognize the difference. Well, the negativity started to, to win out. And the people began complaining against Moses and Aaron and, and even against God. Listen to their words in Numbers 14. It says, then the whole community began weeping aloud. And they cried all night. <laughs> their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt or if here in the wilderness, they complained. God's got to be thinking, don't tempt me, right? Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Then they plotted among themselves and said, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Are you kidding me? Let's go back to Egypt. Let's just go back and be slaves again. That sounds like a good idea. Caleb is joined by another one of the spies here, and Joshua comes alongside him, and, and he feels like he's got to have Caleb's back, I think, here. And in verses 8 and 9, it says, and if the Lord is pleased with us, listen, he'll bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord, and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection. Here's the key. The Lord is with us. Are you all forgetting that? The Lord is on our side. Don't be afraid of them. Now see, the Apostle Paul warns over in the New Testament to not trust in human wisdom. And that's what these other Israelites were doing. They just looked through physical eyes at the physical circumstances only, and it didn't look like a good matchup. And they said, I, I'm not going to do it. I'm playing it safe. But Caleb and Joshua were seeing the big picture and they factored God into the equation, which is a whole different ballgame. The other ten spies could only focus on what they were seeing physically. As people of faith, we have to remember that we must choose to focus not on the storm, but on the one who controls the storm. Don't spend your days and nights wringing your hands and fretting and worrying over the circumstances of this earth, but look to the God of the universe who put all the circumstances of this earth into place and say, what do you think about this? Should we move forward in faith, or are you telling me that we need to pause and reflect for a moment and maybe redirect? It's important in every situation to go to the Almighty and say, what do you think about this situation? Caleb and Joshua were focused on the promises and the provision of God instead of the size of the challenge ahead of them. That was irrelevant to them. Didn't matter if they were 20 feet tall. If they had a promise of God, they were ready to move forward in faith. God had promised them he was going to deliver them into that land. So they could not understand for the life of them what they were waiting on. Here's the opportunity. We have been waiting for this for 400 years. Let's do it. And the rest were saying... No, don't think it's a good idea. Romans 8.31 says, if God is for us, who in the world can be against us? That was the attitude of Caleb and Joshua. And God weighs in. He expresses his frustration with the lack of faith among the Israelite people. In, in Numbers 14, verse 11 says, and the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me? even after all the miraculous signs that I've done for them? God is frustrated here. What do I have to do for you people, for you to learn that I can be trusted, that, that, that I have power, that my power is greater than any power? I showed you 10 different ways back in Egypt that I was superior to the gods of Egypt. What are you waiting on? How quickly the Israelites seem to have forgotten 
the miraculous things they had seen God do. How in the world could they doubt God after they'd seen the plagues and the power of God on display? How could they doubt God after walking through a body of water where there was a wall on each side and they walked through on dry ground? That would tend to stick in your memory, I would think. How could they doubt God when they had received manna from heaven? How could they doubt God after they had been led by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night? How quickly they forget. Did they really think that God was going to bring them through all that drama just to this point to leave them and let them fall on their face? Now before we're too hard on the Israelites, let's think about us today. Let's ask ourselves some questions. How many times have you been in a crisis or a storm, and the man with anxiety here is preaching to himself, and you freak out. You freak out just a little bit for a little while. I still have a good freak out every now and then. My dad can attest to the times I call and go, can you talk a minute, right? He knows about those, but I'm learning to look up. I'm learning that, that the, the testing of our faith develops perseverance how many times do we throw pity parties and say god i don't understand why you would let this happen to me it's not fair i'm trying to be a good person it's not fair make it happen to those bad people we throw ourselves a pity party and we gather people that'll feel sorry for us how many times do we get fearful do we lose hope and we go it's never gonna work i quit how many times do we even get angry with god and say, God, I've been nothing but good. Why are you letting this happen? Is that anybody here today? Look, I'm not judging you. I've been there myself. But we got to learn the lessons of the wilderness. When we find ourselves facing a trial or a challenge in life, here's one of the most important lessons I've learned. When you're in the midst of a trial, that's the time to look back. That's the time to look back. That's what the Israelites didn't do. Because if they looked back, they would have remembered the plagues. They would have remembered the Red Sea. They would have surely remembered the manna and the cloud and the pillar of fire. But all they could see was the challenge in front of them. This is something Dana and I are trying to learn uh, and remind each other of. And sometimes she'll remind me, sometimes I'll remind her. But when we're concerned about a situation, when we're praying over something, inevitably one of us will say to the other one, how many times has God brought us through? How many times did he show up? We didn't think it was ever going to work out, but then it did. Maybe not the way we expected, but God is so faithful. He has taken us through so many things to bring us to where we are. Why would he start abandoning us now? That's not his nature. Think back to the times in your life when God made a way when there seemed to be no way, like we sing about often here. How many times has he done that for you? You know, one of my favorite movies is War Room. And uh, how many of y'all have seen that movie, War Room? Awesome movie. If you haven't, you owe it to yourself to see it. It's a faith-building movie. But it's a Christian movie about prayer. And there's, the main character is a, a little old lady named Clara. And then she's got a younger friend named Elizabeth who's her real estate agent. But really, Clara is mentoring. She's going to come into this mentoring relationship with her real estate agent while she's selling her house. And there's this scene where Miss Clara is showing Elizabeth, the, the real estate lady, through her house. And they come to this one wall, and there's pictures of her family, but there's this one framed picture right in the middle of it all. And Elizabeth says, what is that? And it's got all these different sentences written on that, just real neatly on that. It's framed. And and she says, oh, that's my wall of remembrance. She said, when things aren't going so well, I look back on it, and I'm reminded that God is still in control, and it encourages me. Church, we need a wall of remembrance. And maybe somebody today needs to physically take some time this afternoon to just sit down with pen and paper and write down all the times God has brought you through. The times when you didn't know if there was going to be a way. When times were lean and you were under great stress and pressure. And to go back and to see God's faithfulness for yourself. Maybe that would be a healthy exercise for us today. You know, 
as we've looked through these Old Testament stories each week, we've studied a real story, not an allegory, not a fable, a real event in history. But God's word is so fascinating that he had it recorded because these, these stories still speak to us today, amen? History has a way of repeating itself, and we see ourselves in the Israelites. We see the beauty and perfection of God's word. There's a big picture that I want you to see today as we look at this story. Let's look at the rest of the story, and I'll show you what I mean. But first, God didn't let the faithless Israelites enter the promised land. Numbers 14 says, but as surely as I live and as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory, not one of these people will enter that land. They have all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I perform both in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again, they have tested me by refusing to listen to my voice. They will never even see the land I swore to give their ancestors. None of those who have treated me with contempt will ever see it. So because of their lack of faith, some of the Israelites, that generation, was forced to wander in the desert. That's why it took 40 years. God says, until you're ready to trust in me, you will not enter into that land. Because your faith is required. Caleb and Joshua, on the other hand, were allowed to, to live long enough. The rest of that generation died off. Caleb and Joshua lived to see the promised land. You know... In the big picture, the story of the Israelites is a picture of deliverance. And I want you to see what I'm talking about. The time that the Israelites spent in slavery in Egypt represents the time we spent in bondage to sin. Before Christ came into our lives, we were slaves to sin, Jesus says in John 8, 34. We were in bondage, and it's a dark time uh, where we were separated from God. But then the Red Sea, this is this great story of deliverance and, and, and baptism. I want you to see that in here. 1 Corinthians 10, 2 kind of gives us a hint at the big picture when it says, In the cloud and in the sea, this is a New Testament scripture reflecting back, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. He's linking the two. The Red Sea represents salvation. That time in our life when we said, I can't get to God on my own. I need somebody to deliver me. And Moses is a symbol of Jesus. And Jesus is the only one who can truly deliver us. And Moses led them through the Red Sea. Miraculously, the waters parted and they walked through the waters to the other side. And they emerged on the other side of the Red Sea after it closed in on their enemies and their pursuers. And they were a new creation. They were now free from the bonds of sin. Everything in their old life was on the other side of the waters, and now they were free, free indeed. And that represents that moment of baptism that is marked when we die to ourselves and we are cleansed with the blood of Jesus and we raise up a new creation. We too pass through the waters, that water that separates our old life from our new life in Christ. It represents deliverance and baptism. The wilderness represents a life that is not lived by faith. When I think of those today who are spiritually wandering in the wilderness, I think of those who want Jesus as their Savior. They want a get out of hell free card, but they don't either don't understand or they don't want Jesus as their Lord. And so they're just kind of wandering. They're not really living their life on the purpose that they could be because they're not living each day by faith. They're not walking by faith in their daily lives. They're content to live this life of compromise where they still got one foot back in Egypt, but they're trying to straddle the Red Sea and have one foot in the new life that God wants them to live. Friends, can I tell you that this journey doesn't work that way? The Red Sea is the dividing line between the old and the new life, the journey to the promised land. One of the tragedies of the wilderness is that you miss out on many of the blessings experienced by those who walk by faith. You miss out on many of the blessings. Listen, there is an intimacy with God that if you're not walking with him daily by faith, you might not experience. God doesn't want to just hover over you and lord over you, but God wants to place his spirit in your life and live each day with you do you understand what i'm saying that is an intimate relationship that people who only have religion and don't have the relationship they don't get it they don't know what we're talking about 
There is a peace that passes all understanding that even when you're going through the storm, that the spirit of the living God has given you a peace that doesn't make sense even to you. And those that aren't walking each day by faith are missing out on that. There is a sense of fulfillment and purpose that if all you're doing is going to a job to make some money to pay some bills so that you can get up and go to a job and make some money and pay some bills, if that's what your life is, it doesn't have meaning, it doesn't have purpose. But God says, once you pass through the waters, I want to give you a purpose for the rest of your days here on this earth. If you'll follow me by faith, I've got exciting things in store for you. I want to use your gifts and talents that I gave you for my kingdom. And each day you get up not just to pay bills, but to live out my will for my glory. Maybe somebody today needs that. Maybe if you're honest, you're kind of wandering. You're wandering in the wilderness. And finally, church, the promised land represents a victorious Christian life. And when I say victorious, I'm not talking about health, wealth, and prosperity. We're all going to be millionaires. And that. God defines a victorious Christian life as one that is fully surrendered to him. A spirit-filled life. We give every part of ourselves to him. It's a life lived by faith, following the leading of his word and following the leading of his Holy Spirit, holding nothing back. 1 John 5, 4 says, for every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. Day by day, we get this victory. And I know Christian people who have, we've prayed for, and they passed away. And somebody might say, well, where's your faith, Greg? Well, God didn't answer the prayer. Yeah, he did. Let me tell you. People say, oh, well, they lost their battle with this illness. Nope. They lived every day they had here on this earth by faith. And then they went on to their reward. That's winning. That's winning. They didn't lose anything. Uh, because they lived by faith until the very end. I believe this is the mindset that the Apostle Paul had when he wrote this in 1 Timothy chapter 4. When he realized, my earthly journey is about to end. But he says these words, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Friends, maybe somebody here today is still back in Egypt. And maybe you're still languishing and, and you're living under the bondage of sin and you need to step forward by faith and let uh, the, the New Testament Moses, let Jesus who died for you on the cross redeem you from your sins and lead you through the Red Sea to the other side. But maybe somebody has, been, has done that, but you're now in the wilderness and you're, you don't understand this life by faith and you're just wandering and you're struggling. You're making circles in a desert. You don't feel that purpose. You don't feel that, that peace and that, that contentment and that fulfillment in your life. Can I encourage you to step forward today and come talk to somebody? We would love to tell you how you can live each day by faith. Matthew 10, 39 says, if you cling to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you'll find it by living each day by faith. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you today for deliverance. We thank you that you brought us out of Egypt. You brought us through the waters, God. And now, Lord, sometimes we find ourselves wandering, whether it's doubt, frustration, fear, just a lack of understanding, a lack of purpose. God, I pray that everybody here today, everybody listening online or by radio, realizes that you have come to give us not only eternal life, but abundant life now that you want to live each day with us by purpose God if there's anybody wandering pointlessly and aimlessly through this life let them know today let them feel it through your Holy Spirit you have purpose and plans for their life you want to use the rest of their days to fill it with purpose and meaning Lord we do it by faith we just get up every day and we follow the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night Today we call that your precious Holy Spirit. Would you help us on this journey, God? Help us to live a victorious life 
and guide us safely to your perfect promised land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. If, you have, if you'd like to talk to somebody about a decision on your heart or you need to pray with somebody, come over there to the curtain and see us. If you want to come and pray here today, you can kneel or stand right here and pray here at the stage.